so once again, thank you for tuning in. I know it's a little bit late on a Thursday night, so thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Brooke, and I am a sports dietitian. Um, I specialize in working with really college athletes is kind of my, my main focus, but I work with athletes of all different levels from high school all the way up to masters. Um, so I'm really happy to be here with, with you guys. So a little bit about me, so you don't feel like you're talking or hearing from a complete stranger, especially because we're, we're meeting via Zoom. So I did, I did attend Case Western, which I know is like a crosstown rival. So don't hate me for that. Um, but I did get my undergraduate as well as my master's and I completed my dietetic internship all at Case Western. I played basketball for four years there. And uh, I also had the opportunity to hang around for an extra year and actually coach. So I got to kind of see both sides of life in the athletic world. Um, and it, it was really, really beneficial and has really helped me even to today. My basketball career is has come to an end, unfortunately, um, but now I do ultra ultra endurance events. So I do Ironman triathlons and duathlons, marathons, those sorts of things, and really really enjoy that. Um, huge dog lover. I have two dogs, as you can see. I am also happily married, but he didn't make the cut with the about me page. So priorities, right? Um, but then the reason I'm here, the reason I'm here is because I own my own private practice called nutrition with Brooke. Like I mentioned at the beginning, I work with all different kinds of athletes, but I really, really love working with the college, the college world. And I know not everyone on the call is a technically a student athlete, but I think everyone really is an athlete. If you're, if you move every day, if you're active every day, I think the term athlete can definitely be applied in more than one way. So you're all in the right spot. Uh, this, this past year, I've actually been doing a little bit of uh, more work with Oberlin. I've been working with their football team and a couple other teams giving some different workshop talks. So I really enjoyed getting to know your campus and come, some of your, your student population. So really cool spot you guys have out there in Oberlin. Okay, let's dive in. Throughout the entire presentation, if you guys have any questions at all, like feel free to just interrupt me, um, throw it in the chat. I have kind of like two windows going on here. So if I miss it in the chat, we will talk about it at the end when we have another question session. In terms of what we're going to cover tonight, uh, we're going to kind of cover a wide range of things. I got with Sarah who helped organize this whole thing and she gave me some of the questions that you guys had had brought up to her. So I tried to integrate that into this. Um, but really, we're going to focus on everything we're going to focus on is going to be something that you can apply to student life when in college. So kind of no matter what your overall end goal is, my hope is that what we cover here, you guys can implement, whether it's maybe you are an athlete in college, maybe you implement it to practice or to, to games, or if you're just kind of a more everyday athlete, you, you integrate it into your workouts um, or just, you know, go in day to day life. So something here for everybody. So we're going to start by just really quick covering the basics because I'm going to keep using these terms throughout the rest of the presentation. So I want us all to be on the same page in terms of what are the basics of nutrition. The first word you're going to probably hear me say a lot is calories, which I'm sure we are all well aware of what calories are. They are in every single thing that we eat and drink. Um, and the biggest question I get as a dietitian when I meet with my clients is tell me like, how much do I need? I, I want to know exactly how many calories I can eat or I should be eating to maximize my efforts? That's a really, really individualized question. When we talk about calories, we talk about how, many, how much you have to take in to balance how much you're putting out in terms of energy. And there's a couple of things that go into that. There's what we call BMR, which is like the baseline energy that you need for like your body to function, for your lungs to breathe, for your heart to pump blood. That takes energy. It takes, you need calories for that to happen. So BMR is like the basic function of your body. Then there's NEAT, which is non-exercise activities, thermoregulation, I think is the technical term. Essentially, that means everyday activities. That means brushing your teeth, walking down the stairs, walking to class, walking to practice. Those also take energy, right? So that's going to go into your, your total overall needs. There's also a thermic effect of food, the amount of energy it takes to break down and uh, utilize food. And then there's exercise, right? Activity, movement, workouts, lifting, strength training, that all goes into it. So as you can tell, there are lots of different things that contribute to your overall calorie needs. That's why it is very individualized. This is all based on you know, your gender, your goals when it comes to body composition. Are you trying to gain weight, lose weight, maintain weight, your age, your activity level? Um, genetics plays a huge factor. I mean, that is something that a lot of us can't, don't have control over. So there's just a lot that goes into calorie needs. I think it's important to hear that because someone who is the same gender and the same exact size as you might have different needs than you based on X, Y, or Z. 
we're all really different and it's really important to remember that. What makes up these calories? There's macronutrients and micronutrients. We're gonna talk for the basic purpose of this as of macronutrients. So macronutrients are protein, carbs, and fats, the three of them. Protein, why do we need protein? Why is it so important? It's because protein is, especially in the world of active individuals, um, it's really key for muscle and tissue repair and growth. If you wanna build muscle, you have to have protein to do so. If you wanna recover after a hard workout or after a practice, you need protein. In terms of how much, the very minimum for humans is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. If you wanna do a quick calculation, you do not have to. All you do is take your body weight in pounds, divide it by two, excuse me, 2.2, that'll give you your weight in kilograms and multiply it by 0.8. So an example is there, as you can see, if you're 150 pounds, the minimum is around 55 grams of protein. Once again, that will, that will probably go up as you get more active, as depending on your goals, et cetera, et cetera. Next is fats. I think a lot of people often think they need to avoid fat. Um, that's not necessarily the case because fat is actually really essential. It is what helps absorb all of our energy and vitamins into our body. It's also really key in hormone balance, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. In terms of how much fat you need, it's never usually an issue, especially of the American population that we don't get enough fat. Um, it ends up, the gold standard is around one gram per kilogram of body weight per day, but we get that no problem. The area that we, you and I can really start to focus in on and try to work on a little bit is where we're getting those, those sources of fat from. There's all different kinds of fats. The one that I wanna talk about is unsaturated fatty acids. These are kind of what you would hear if people are saying healthy fats, they're talking about these typically unsaturated fatty acids, more specifically, omega-3s. The reason these are so important for overall health, but also for active and wellness individuals is uh, omega-3s, really support anti-inflammatory effects. So it actually tries to inhibit inflammation in the body, which is great, right? We want that. It also is really helpful for mental function and, cog and cognitive function, which we also, we always want that, don't we? Um, so really trying to get some of these omega-3s into your diet from you know seeds and nuts, uh, fatty fish, um, avocados. Those are gonna have those healthier fats that yes, they might be high in calories, but those are like really good calories that, that our body needs. So maybe trying to start looking at your own diet and seeing where you can maybe take out some like the saturated fats, like the fried food um, or the packaged food and try to put in some more of these healthier fats. Kind of a simple, simple swap to start with. And the last macronutrient is carbohydrates. This is probably the, the biggest of them all because this is our main source of energy. We're going to get in a couple of slides. I'll show you that no matter what your activity level is, you need carbohydrates for energy. We're gonna talk about that. Um, but just trust me when I say that you need carbohydrates for energy. Even on days that you aren't working out, you aren't exercising, you still need carbohydrates. Um, there is a direct correlation between a between fatigue and low carbohydrate, carbohydrate levels. I talked to your some of your uh, coaches and staff a little bit earlier and we were talking about how we all sometimes hit like that afternoon wall, right? You feel really low on energy, you had a long day. A lot of that can be contributed to fueling practices and not having enough carbohydrate in our system or not utilizing proper timing when it comes to carbohydrates. So it's all correlated. We can all, we can do some things to, to fix it. There are kind of two categories when we talk about carbohydrates. The first being complex carbohydrates. All this means that it takes a little bit longer for your body to break them down and get the goodness out of those carbohydrates. These are going to be your whole grain breads and pastas, your oats, your legumes, your beans, um, those kind of things that take a little bit more time to digest. Simple carbohydrates are just the opposite. You still need them and use them um, because they're a quicker source of energy. They're like the gel shots you would see like marathoners drink, eating or drinking, um, crackers or pretzels, applesauce, um, white bread, white pasta. Those are going to be a little bit quicker, qu a little bit more quickly digested and can be used as more immediate energy. There's a time and place for both of them, especially around exercise and working out, we're gonna, there is a proper time to use those simple carbohydrates. But for the most part, day to day, we want a higher ratio of complex carbohydrates in our diet and a little bit lesser of those simple carbohydrates in our diet. This image on the bottom, you might've seen it before. It's from um, the CPSDA, which is the a, a, a practice group I'm a member of. And I just, I don't want you to obsess over it, but I want you to see that carbohydrates is something that really fluctuates day in and day out. 
So de no, depending on the day, depending on how active you are, if it's a game day or if you have like a multiple workout day um, or you have a rest day, the amount of carbohydrates that you should be eating on average is what's going to fluctuate the most. As you can see on the left, it's like an easy training day. You can see that there's only about maybe, I don't know, a sixth or a, a, a fifth maybe <laughs> of your plate is carbohydrates. The rest is fruits and vegetables, which fruits are also carbohydrates, but you can see that about a third or a fifth is about starchy carbohydrates, I should say. About a quarter is protein. On a moderate training day, so on a day where you go to the gym, where you do a workout, you go for a run, or you go for a long walk, you're gonna increase the amount of carbohydrates you need by a little bit because you expended more energy. So you have to take in some more energy, but you still have about a quarter of your plate protein and the rest of your plate vegetables and fruit. And then on really hard training days, on days where you do maybe a morning workout and an afternoon workout or a really hard game, that's when you have the most amount of carbohydrates because you expended the most amount of energy. Taking this mindset into what your day-to-day -day life looks like is really beneficial because you're, you're, you should be eating based on the day. You shouldn't always you know, kind of be eating the same things or you guys, you can be eating the same things, but not necessarily the same amounts. Hopefully that, that makes sense. Uh, okay, so that's enough on carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Just wanted to cover all our bases before we dove in to the good stuff. So our first topic we're gonna talk about is snacking. And I think this is important to talk about regardless of kind of where you're at right now is because especially as college students, um, you're always on the go, right? Even though right now things look maybe a little bit different with COVID and virtual classes and stuff, you're still a really busy individual. So snacking is actually a really beneficial tool that you can, if, if, you, if it's used properly, which I said right there. <laughs> um, so why snacking is so important is because like I said, oftentimes we don't have time to sit and have a whole meal, right? You're grabbing, you're grabbing food on your way out the door or you're grabbing it right before you go to a workout, hit the gym, or you just are trying to multitask. You're studying, you're going to classes and all that good stuff. So using snacking can make sure that you guys are staying properly fueled throughout the day. This can help boost your mental performance. It can help with weight management. If you, whether you wanna lose weight, gain weight, snacking can play a role there. Um, it's just, it's just a really important tool for any sort of active individual, which all of you are. Also, if you are, I would say like, yeah, active individuals, it also is really helpful for muscle recovery. So when you do a really hard workout, if you don't eat properly afterwards, cause you're not hungry, you're not, you're going to inhibit your recovery. Where if you utilize snacking, maybe afterwards as an option, it'll improve recovery. So snacking really is a really beneficial tool if, if utilized properly. On average, maybe looking at maybe two to four snacks a day. This is gonna be different for each of you based on your schedule, um, based on if you eat, do you eat two meals a day? Do you eat three meals a day? Um, or do you just kind of do small snacks throughout the day? It's gonna be really based on your habits, what you what you prefer, as well as your hunger cues. So lots of different things go into determining what your actual schedule is. If you want help looking at your schedule and seeing how often, like where you should add in some snacks, send me an email. Uh, for the most part, once again, for active individuals, usually three meals a day is not enough. And so typically what I talk with my athletes about is really fueling every three to four hours. Once again, depending on the intensity and how often you are exercising, that will dictate if it's longer or shorter. But on average, about every three to four hours is a good range to check in with yourself and see, have I fueled in a while? Am I feeling low on energy? And kind of using that as a check-in point to see where you're at. That kind of rolls into the last or to the, the next point of, while snacking is, snacking is also really great because it um, can really force you to familiarize, familiarize yourself, excuse me, with your hunger cues. Um, if it gets to the point where it's late at night, you've been up studying a long time and you're getting really lethargic, you're getting headaches, um, your tummy is like screaming at you, you've gone too long without fueling. So really trying to hone in on earlier signs of hunger so that you can kind of stay ahead of the game and stay on top of it so that it supports you throughout the day. We don't want to wait too long where once again, you're trying to make, play makeup for it. And then if we wait too long, we start to overeat and we eat empty calories kind of a whole downhill water slide there. Um, so we wanna to try to catch it early, stay on top of it and utilize snacking to stay ahead of the game. Okay, um, now an important point here is 
snacks versus treats. I think once again, snacking can, can get a bad rap because people think that snacks are like cookies and chips and all that good stuff. When I when I'm talking about snacks, I'm talking about nutrient nutrient rich, nutrient dense snacks. So, um, you know, Greek yogurt or peanut butter and jelly toast or apples and like an almond butter, something that has a lot of good whole food sources, good whole grains, good vitamins, good mac, good micronutrients, lots of good stuff in it. A snack also satisfies satisfies your hunger. So when you eat a real good nutritious snack, you should feel full, you should feel satiated and you can move on with your day. And then snacks support muscle recovery and support proper fueling. A treat on the other hand, on the other hand is the opposite. So treats are those empty calories. They satisfy cravings versus true hunger. Having too many of these can actually impair muscle recovery and proper fueling. Uh, but also hear me say there is a time and place for these. So I am in no way saying cut out all these treats. Heck no, I have a major sweet tooth. So I'm the first one to grab a cookie if I can. Um, it's just about knowing timing and when and how is the best way to incorporate that day to day. Actually, a lot of research has got cut, <clears throat> excuse me, has come out that utilizing kind of a more balanced diet that incorporates treats, as you would call them more frequently, is actually more successful than not allowing yourself to have treats during the week and only allowing yourself to have them on the weekend. That sort of regimen has actually been found to be more detrimental. So maybe just start trying to in incorporate some treats sparingly more throughout, like more consistently, but really utilizing nutritious snacks as much as possible. Okay, so a couple of tips to be successful when it comes to snack. I know this sounds kind of funny that we're talking so seriously about snacking, but it really is a beneficial tool for, for college students. The first is plan ahead. As I mentioned before, with busy schedules, I've been there not too long ago, um, but with busy schedules, carve out five or 10 minutes before bed the night before, or even before you start your day the next morning to kind of set yourself up for success. Throw some extra snacks in your bag or cut up some extra fruit and vegetables or make a list at least of where, what you're gonna, if you need to go to the store, like just really set yourself up for success so that when you come time, when it comes time to fuel or you're feeling hungry, you have a plan of what you're gonna do. Because when we don't have a plan, that's when we start to go to the vending machine and grab whatever's in there. Which once again, some fuel's better than no fuel. So I, it's not gonna be perfect all the time and that's okay. But the more that we can plan ahead, the more successful that we're gonna be with it. <clears throat> The next is take a moment, maybe after we hang up with the call um, and write down your schedule, write down your classes, write down your, whenever you go to the gym, if you have practices, any other extracurricular activities and see what your time gaps are between those. And maybe physically write in like when you think you should be fueling to try to support that more frequent feeling throughout the day. Cause I'm promising you more frequent feeling throughout the day will help limit any of those crazy cravings that we get at night. It really is, really is helpful. Next is keeping snacks easily accessible, kind of as I mentioned ahead, putting snacks in every single place that you frequent, that you go frequently, whether it's maybe the lab, maybe you have like a locker in your lab, just throw a bunch of snacks in there <clears throat> or in your backpack or in your purse, in your car, if you drive to and from campus, um, in your locker room, if you have locker rooms right now. So wherever you're, you are frequently, stash some snacks because the worst thing you can do is be really hungry and not have any options. So it's really important to try to set yourself up for set yourself up for success in that aspect. Next is stick to, stick to your schedule. As busy as we are, it only takes a couple minutes to get some sort of fuel in your system, especially if it's before any sort of exercise. If it's so much more important that you take an extra five minutes, have a banana, have a couple bites of a granola bar, give yourself a few minutes to digest it versus just skipping it, skipping over and going right into the exercise. You might feel okay to start with, but you're gonna hit the wall earlier on. Whereas if you just take five minutes to have a little bit of fuel, that's where those simple carbohydrates come into play, you'll feel so much better throughout the longevity of your exercise. And then last, make it affordable. Snacking does not have to be this like crazy expensive aspect of your life. All those like energy bars or nutrition bars, which are convenient, you can have a lot more affordable options with dried fruit, fresh fruit, bananas, apples, um, beef jerky. All those cost a lot less than like the really expensive, fancy brand name energy bars. If you that's your thing, go for it. I use energy bars. I love them. Um, but just there are other options out there that are more affordable. So don't be intimidated by that. Here's a list of some other what I what I think are really affordable snack options. 
peanut butter is a protein, also has some carbohydrates in it. So you can put that on pretty much anything. Um, trail mix, make your own trail mix. That will save you even more money. Go buy a bunch of like the big bags of popcorn and nuts and seeds, throw it together. You have your own trail mix. Um, turkey or like deli meat roll ups with cheese, really easy, really quick. Uh, fruit and yogurt, those snack packs, those balanced breaks, maybe you've seen like at grocery stores or there's all sorts of different off-brand ones too. Those are a, a really complete snack. They have a good carbohydrate, a good protein, which are our two main priorities there. So it does not have to be fancy. It can be really simple. And last piece of the snacking is if you don't pack snack, let's say you've, you're hungry and the only option you have is like some, some place on campus where I know if you have a couple places that you can like grab stuff and go, um, or if you're at like a convenience store, uh, how can you try to make the most the most nutritious options when you're limited to a store. These are real life pictures that I took actually recently on a road trip, um, which is actually exciting to see that some of these, they're, they're starting to catch on these like fresher options at convenience stores or gas stations. Um, so first is if you're in the store, use the refrigerated section. That's where a lot of the good fresher options are gonna be, obviously, because it's being refrigerated. Like the hummus and pretzels, there's avocado toast bites that I see everywhere. Your yogurts are gonna be over here. Your Lunchables, go back to the elementary school days where you've had Lunchables for lunch. And while yes, they're maybe not like the gold standard, if you think about it, they have the basics. They have protein in your, whatever meat you choose, carbohydrates in the, in the crackers, and then some sort of fat and some protein in the cheese. Once again, is it pretty? No, but it's so convenient. And it's actually maybe one of the better options than grabbing like a prepackaged something else off of the, off the shelf. So something to think about there, it does not have to be complicated. Additionally, I tend to I have found, and it's intentional, that some of the healthier options tend to be on the lower parts of shelves. Um, this is strategic, obviously, because they wanna sell you the other things that are they make more money on. Um, so these are all options with, again, real life pictures of some of the healthier options that are all lower down. So you see like popcorn there, those popcorn chips are delicious. In terms of bars, you see fig bars and kind bars. Once again, on the lower, lower shelves, you see the beef jerkies, not only beef jerky, they have turkey jerky, they have different flavors. Once again, lower down, as well as on the far right hand side, you see your nuts, your seeds, some pretzel pretzel thins, all there, just look a little bit lower. So if you get overwhelmed by all everything else in front of you, look a little bit lower, that's kind of a good place to start. And that is because of candy trigger. This is a real thing. We have all been guilty of it, I'm sure. I know I have been. I'm checking out of the grocery store and I'm like, oh, I need that Reese's peanut butter cup just to get me home when I don't really need it, but it's right there in front of you and it's, it's calling you, right? Um, that is called candy trigger. There's tons of research out there. This is all very sneaky, not even sneaky, really good marketing and it's really effective marketing. Once again, can you have treats? Can you have some of your favorite foods? Absolutely. But just be aware that this is a real thing. And oftentimes like take a second and check in and say, do I really need X, Y, or Z? Do I, am I really hungry for that? If you are, buy it. If you're like, nah, it's just like, an, it's just there, move on from it. Questions about snacking? We covered lots of ground. Okay, I'm sure not missing anybody. Okay, cool. So long story short, snacking can be really helpful, um, especially for active individuals when it comes to well, overall wellness, snacking is really helpful. Shifting our focus to now body weight. This is the most common question I get. Really, it's the most common reason that any athlete wants to work with me is because they want to change their body composition or change their body weight. A couple of things I want to start off with here before we dive into a little bit more of the nitty gritty. A few unpopular truths that I think it's important for you to hear. There is no magic pill. There's no drink. There's no fat burner smoothie. There's no whatever it is that's going to make this happen for you. If you do, if any, if you ever have used any of these magic pills and they've worked, it's probably because if you've lost like a water weight or something and it's not going to be something you can sustain. There is no magic pill. It, changing body composition, whether it's gaining weight or losing weight, takes a lot of work. The reason it takes work is because if it's done properly, you should, we should be teaching you like why it's important and how to be successful and, you know, why it makes sense for your body to do it in this way. We want to create habits that can go on forever versus just a quick fix. 
simple as that. On top of truth, truth number two, your body already has a detox system. Um, it's called your liver and kidneys. And I say this once again, it is so appealing to go for a juice cleanse or a smoothie diet or whatever other cleanses are out there. And it's tempting, but it's not, it's not the right way to go about things. And it's not, it's not true. I know it sounds crazy, but once again, similar like a magic pill, any effects that you see after a cleanse, whether it's you, you lose weight or you feel more energized, it's because you're losing fluid weight or you're losing muscle weight. You're not losing fat weight, fat mass, excuse me. You're not losing fat mass. And the minute you stop whatever cleanse or juicing you're on, you're going to go right back to where you were. It's not something you can sustain and it's not effective and it's not the right way that it's not how your body was meant to work. Your body is meant to use its kidneys and livers, liver <laughs> to, to detox things out. You have a gut full of bacteria that's meant to digest and break down and, you know, take waste products away. So let's use our body for what it's meant to be. And then we can focus on other things that are actually more effective. And number three is eating after 8 p.m. won't cause you to gain weight. This is a big one because I see it on social media. I see it with my athletes that they're like, I'm hungry after dinner, but I know I shouldn't eat because it's too late. And I'm like, let's talk about that. What do you mean by that? And where, I, where it comes from is because take a minute and think about when you're up late studying, what are you craving? What kind of snacks are you grabbing? It's probably a candy bar or a brownie or chicken tenders and fries or, you know, it's, it tends to be nutrient or calorically dense options with high, high in fat, high in sugar, which tastes really good. It's okay to have it every now and then, but eating that late at night for many days, that's going to accumulate calories, which we'll learn on the next slide is where we're going to see weight gain. And that's, what's causing our weight gain. It's not because it's eight o'clock, eight o'clock and your body says, mm, I'm done. I'm going to store all this as fat. Now it's not how it works. It's really more about what we're choosing to eat after eight o'clock than the fact that we're eating after eight o'clock. Does that make, make sense? I can't see many of you, but does that kind of make sense that it's not when we're eating, it's what we're eating. Okay. Ah. So moving on from that, unless there is a medical reason that you need to follow a certain diet for whatever reason it may be, there really is no support as to why we should cut out any other nutrients from our diet especially when you cut out macro. So the best example, and I apologize if anyone's been on the keto diet, um, but keto is a great example. You're essentially cutting out or minimizing by a great amount, the amount of carbohydrates you're taking in. When you cut out one of the macronutrients, such as, such as a carbohydrate, you're cutting out micronutrients, you're cutting out fiber, you're cutting out more than just carbohydrates, which we don't want. We, especially because we need carbohydrates as energy when it comes to active individuals. So for any diet, there's all millions of diets out there where it says, you know, low this high protein, only this cut out sugar. You really need all that in your diet, unless there's another sort of, unless there's a medical reason as to why you, you shouldn't shift that over to that picture you see on your right. Um, that is a great picture that, that shows that no matter what level of exercise or movement you're at, you need all three sources of, especially of your macronutrients. So orange is fats, green is our carbohydrates, and yellow is our protein. As you can see at rest, that's actually when we're going to use most of our fats. Crazy, I know, but that's when the fat pro provides most of our energy. Then our next is our carbohydrates, and you can see protein stays pretty uh, consistent based on any sort of intensity. Next is our light and moderate exercise. You can still see that fat still provides a lot of our energy. And then our carbohydrates start to increase as we increase intensity. And then it continues going on. This is where most of us tend to fall. Um, so you can see that a huge part of our energy, 900% is from carbohydrates. So when you think back to the basic slide, we're talking about carbohydrates and how you need them. This is, you need carbohydrates. We still get a little bit from fats, a little bit from protein, and then so on as you go into high intensity endurance events. So once again, you need all macronutrients unless otherwise medically supported though. Um, that takes us back to fad diets as we we're, were talking about with like keto or um, paleo or whatever it may be, whole 30, uh, while their intention is good, the way that they go about them is maybe not so sustainable. Um, once again, that kind of falls in the category of us just following rules and having a quick fix versus creating lifelong habits that support lifelong change. When you get down to it, the very basis of weight change, whether it's weight gain or weight loss, 
the very basis of it is that if you want to lose weight, you have to be in a calorie deficit. We say about three to 500 calories less than what you actually need. That's how you get into a calorie deficit and start to lose weight. If you want to gain weight, it's the opposite. You have to be in a calorie surplus. You have to give your body about three to 500 calories more than it needs so it can support new muscle development and new body mass development. That's the really basic, basic part of it. And that's why no matter what diet maybe you've tried in the past and what diet has worked in the past, the reason it's worked is because you've been in a calorie deficit. It's not because you've cut out certain food groups or you've you know, done this or that. It's because you've been in a calorie deficit. And if you've gained weight or you wanna gain weight, the only way to do so is to be in a calorie surplus. That's kind of the basis of it. And we'll talk about at the very end, we're gonna talk about some healthy habits that you can kind of start to implement into your day-to-day -day lives. All those healthy habits will contribute to weight management. So it'll all, we'll tie it all together, I promise. Okay, last section, and then we're gonna sum it up here is um, supplements. I got a lot of questions via Sarah about supplements. And I think it's important, especially in the college population, there's so many different things that influencers are pushing or telling you to try or supplement this or whatever. So we're gonna talk about it. But the most important point to keep in mind is that you cannot, you cannot out supplement a bad diet. So you can't have a really crappy diet that's full of fast foods or like every single meal supplement with a bunch of vitamins and minerals and think you're going to be good to go. That's not how it works. We want supplements are meant to supplement the diet. They're meant to fill in the gaps if they exist, but we have a, we really want to do a food first approach where we get as much as we can from our foods. And then, like I said, fill in the gaps where supplements are needed. So first we'll talk about some supplement risks. Um, supplements are not only just like things that are pills. It's also like protein powders, um, amino acids, BCAAs, creatine, even caffeine, less caffeine is coming from just from coffee. Energy drinks are technically supplements. So it's really important that you understand some of the risks associated with any sort of supplement that you maybe are using or are considering using. So the most important thing to know is that supplements are very poorly regulated. The, they are essentially they're, they're not regulated. Um, so they can put a lot of different things on the labeling and advertising and kind of get away with it, which is unfortunate. And it's been a, a battle that dietitians have been fighting for years. Um, so you can, you know, they'll, they'll promise you things or that's where you'll see like, you know, lose five pounds in a week. If you take the supplement, that's because no, there's no reason, there's nothing holding them accountable for that. Um, so don't always be um, tempted by what you see in the advertisements or in the promises. Same with exaggerated claims. If anything, it it's not, it should never say like, this can cure your X, Y, or Z. Not, it's not possible. It's not how supplements work. Um, so essentially these are never guaranteed safe. Even, even one that has a good reputable source, there's still a tiny little bit of chance that there could be something that it could cause some sort of side effect. Now, the best ways to combat this and to do high quality uh, supplements is to look for one of these three labels, um, especially if you are a student athlete where you're in like NCAA, NCAA rules. Um, this is even, even more important, but I think this is important for athletes of all kinds, because if you're supplementing, you want to use a high quality supplement that's going to support you and not harm you in your efforts as you continue to get to improve. So the left is NSF certified. Uh, this means that it has been rig rigorously tested, um, safe for sport, it doesn't contain any banned, su any banned substances. It's like the gold standard. Um, USP is probably the one that you guys have seen most often. It's not catered necessarily, necessarily to athletes, but it still has to go through. It's a, it's a high quality. What it says is on the label is in the label. It's a, it's a fine starting point. And then informed for sport is also similar to NSF just meaning it has really high quality standards and it has been tested for safety, banned, substance, banned substances, et cetera. So these are kind of the, the three that, uh, if you're gonna use a supplement, we prefer that it's one of these. You can actually go to nsf.com, that's all it is. And you can actually put in your supplement name or look for a supplement that is NSF certified. It'll give you a whole list to kind of start, to start with. Um, once again, so before you go over to the slide, as much as I've been as I've been saying, a food first source we're gonna talk we're gonna talk about. If you have if your diet is as balanced as you think it can be and you're happy with where it's at and there still are some gaps, that's where supplements are going to come in. So I don't want you to think that I'm like anti-supplement. I just really think that we can get majority of what we need 
from foods. So I want you to make sure, make sure you hear me say that multiple times. Um, this here are just a couple of ideas of if you're like on the fence about maybe trying, especially one of the more common supplements that are out there right now, the most popular ones, or if you currently utilize one, I just wanted to remind you that there are ways to get these popular supplements in a food form. So let's talk about them. The first is creatine. It's really popular in athletes. Uh, it's actually really well supported in terms of research when it comes to athletes, but your body actually can make creatine on its own as well. And one of the best, the amino acids that are required to make creatine are found in eggs, which are such an affordable option. So incorporating eggs into your diet will support the production of creatine. Kind of cool. Next is collagen. Um, vital proteins collagen is like the most common supplement that I hear my athletes and clients utilizing. And once again, totally fine if you want to use them, just make sure you're using a good NSF certified product, which vital proteins is. Um, but to support the, the collagen in your body, we want to we want to consume foods that support collagen production. The vit or the micronutrients that support collagen production are vitamin C, zinc, and copper. You can see some examples listed here, vitamin C, berries, peppers, citrus fruits, tomatoes, all your fruits and vegetables, pretty much. Zinc is going to be oatmeal and chickpeas are kind of some big ones. And then copper, dark leafy greens, kale, spinach, uh, pumpkin seeds, and cashews. There's going to be a trend as we go through these that you will see lots of different fruits and vegetables, plant-based options. These are all good to incorporate regardless of where you're at. Next is fish oil, a really common supplement because we tend not to get a ton of fish, like healthy fats in our system, which is omega-3s. Um, so you can, you can eat fatty fish, salmon, mackerel, or tuna, um, chia or flax seeds, put them on yogurt, put them in smoothies, um, put them on toast even, <laughs> but incorporating those. Same with walnuts, put them on a salad, put them in a smoothie, whatever it may be. Uh, last is, ma is magnesium. Magnesium is huge for cellular, cellular reproduction, energy production, um, it also can help you go to sleep, sleep well, lots of good benefits for magnesium. Once again, black beans, brown rice, seeds. You're seeing a trend here of, of some of some foods that have are really good sources of these micronutrients that people spend millions of dollars on supplementing. Which once again, if you still choose to do that, that is okay. Just understand there are ways to get these in our diet without having to use a, use a supplement. We're in the last home stretch. Any questions about supplements before we go into the last section of the talk? I think I saw a chat come up. So let me check it really quick. Maybe not. Yeah. Well, okay, we'll talk, we'll talk about the question in the chat at the end. That's a great question. Okay. So five healthy habits that take kind of everything that we just talked about and tie it up and let's start to put it into, into practice, right? Before we go into that, I think hopefully you've kind of caught on the trend that I am a dietitian that believes in balance. Um, but Dr. Dr. Will, he wrote a great book that I'm a huge fan of. And he actually said that you can make as many healthy swaps as you want, but you can't swap out happiness. So even though we're gonna try to tweak your diet a little bit, which will require maybe subbing in some healthier options, some more whole food options, it doesn't mean that you can't go to a celebration and have dessert. It doesn't mean that you can't have chips and dip at a football game. Like it's, he says it, I say it, it is so important to incorporate balance into your life because that all goes back to sustainable changes. If we cut out our favorite foods, if we go crazy drastic change, we're not gonna be successful in the long term. So really, really understand that, that yes, it's important to make some changes and make some healthy swaps and make some healthy habits, but it's also okay to, give yourself a little bit of grace and do it slowly and, and be okay with having some days that maybe aren't gonna be picture perfect. So I want you to hear me say that before we go into this last part here. Okay, so we're gonna cover these five healthy habits, choosing quality calories, checking your drink, eating the rainbow, meet your protein needs and sleep. And then we'll get you out of here. The first is choosing quality calories. My format's all funky there, sorry about that. Um, so essentially I want you to look with two pictures. On the left is Pop-Tarts, which we're hopefully all familiar with because they're a childhood classic. Um, and on the right is a Greek yogurt parfait with fruit, nuts, and granola. These are both 400 calories. So you can choose either one of them and you're gonna have 400 calories going into your body. But let's think about what we're getting out of both of them. In the Pop-Tart, we're getting flour, sugar, and syrup. We're getting sugar, which is, once again, every now and then, it's fine. Out of the Greek yogurt, we're getting 
protein, fiber, micronutrients. Um, we have whole food options here. We have the milk, oats, fruit. We have things that we understand and can pronounce in this option. So while once again, every now and then having the Pop-Tart because you're really craving it, that's okay. But if we were to have the Greek yogurt parfait more often, it'll fill us up. We're going to have more energy out of it. We'll have more balanced energy out of it. And it will contribute more to our overall diet for the entire day. It's going to give us that protein that we need where with a Pop-Tart, you're going to, you're going to enjoy it for a second. You're going to maybe have a quick surge of energy for a little bit and you're going to crash because you don't have any protein in there. So really trying to start to think where you can make these kind of whole food changes and additions to get more out of your, your snacking, your meals, whatever it may be. So choosing quality calories that give you a little bit more bang for your buck. <clears throat> that actually rolls really nicely into this, into number two, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, check your drink. So first as active individuals and just for overall day-to-day -day health, it's really important to stay hydrated. So number one is to uh, carry a water bottle with you all the time. You should be sipping on it throughout the day, throughout practice, throughout your exercise. You should be having water throughout the entire day. A good starting point is to take your body weight, divide it by two, and that's approximately how many ounces you should be having a day. Once again, that's a baseline that will vary based on various aspects. So when I say check your drink, I'm saying think about what else, what you're drinking throughout the day besides water. Maybe you're having a juice with breakfast or a coffee on your way to class. Maybe you're having a tea or a, some sort of drink with lunch, something with dinner. Before you know it, as the, as the picture indicates, that you can be taking in over a thousand calories without even feeling it, without even having any of the benefits of those calories because they're just, that's just calories. It's just empty, empty calories. And so this is an area that if you want to lose weight, we can cut out some calories here. Or if you want to gain weight, you can substitute in actually good nutritious food options rather than having an empty drink that's going to offer you no benefit. A couple ones to highlight here is flavored water. There's so many options out there now. Um, just take a second and look at the ingredient label and see where the flavor is coming from. If it's from like a fruit juice or like real fruit, that's awesome. But if it's from added sugar, once again, it's going to have lots more calories than just plain water. So thinking about that. Coffee shops. I love my coffee every now and then. Um, but trying to opt for a skim milk versus a whole milk or even a, even a reduced fat milk or asking for half the syrup. It's yes, a little bit sweeter, but I promise you, like it does not take long to adjust to it and you still get that good, like yummy flavor. So, and that you'll be amazed at how just cutting back on the syrup and the, the type of milk can cut out a lot of extra calories that we just don't need every day. Um, and then the last big one, especially, I keep saying the word active individuals, but alcohol is, is something that can not only, is not only empty calories for us, but it actually can really inhibit your performance. And it's, it's especially inhibitory um, when you, because oftentimes we drink alcohol at night, right? After you had a workout or after you did a race, you see all the time, like 5Ks, you end a 5K and you can go get a free beer in the post-race expo. It's cool in theory, um, but consumption of alcohol post-exercise, post-workout can actually decrease your muscle protein, muscle protein synthesis. So essentially, you're giving yourself only about 60% of the benefit of the workout you just did if you take it, if you drink alcohol on an empty stomach right afterwards, um, it delays the recovery process. It delays the um, restoration of glyco glycogen stores. So it just takes, it makes everything go a lot slower, which maybe you felt uh, if you're of age, maybe you've felt the, the, felt the wrath of having a beer too late at night and then trying to get up the next morning and do a workout or whatever it may be. So just start to think about how to be intentional about your, your, your drinks. Um, especially when it comes to alcohol, time and a place for it. Um, but there's no, we don't want to inhibit all the hard work you just did. So just be mindful about that as well. Healthy habit number three is eat the rainbow. So choosing as we, we talked about in supplements, as we talked about in uh, micronutrients, or as we talked about in uh, the basics of nutrition, we need fruits and vegetables. They are so chock full of micronutrients. They're chock full of antioxidants and phytochemicals and minerals and all sorts of good stuff. And we need them. Not only do we need, if you could eat an apple a day, that'd be great, but it'd be even better if you could eat an apple a day, plus a banana and some broccoli, like more variety. Why variety is so key. We didn't talk much about this, but why variety is key is because the more variety of 
fiber we can get in our system and we get lots of fiber from fruits and vegetables, the, the actual, the, the healthier our gut is, the healthier our gut is, oh my gosh, the healthier our whole body. And it's connected to so many different systems in the body um, that it, it really is effective. So we wanna have a lot of variety of fruits and vegetables as much as possible. We also want variety because each different color essentially of especially vegetables and fruit, each different color represents different micronutrients. It's gonna have different antioxidants, different, different vitamins, different um, things that, we, that our body craves. So the more variety, the better. Especially as college students, I don't know if, I'm sorry, I'm sure some of you are on meal plans or maybe some of you have a kitchen or you have a mixture of both, um, but the frozen section can be your best friend. Uh, frozen fruits and vegetables are so convenient. They take maybe five minutes to cook, especially if for a vegetable, you put it in the microwave and you're, you're set. Um, they're often picked at their like peak ripeness and their peak nutrient density. So use the frozen section. Don't be afraid to, to utilize that, especially because I don't know about you, but I buy lots of produce and then by the end of the week, half of it's already bad. So use that, that frozen section and have that be a way that you increase your convenience and you increase your fruit and vegetable intake. Okay, we're almost there, hang with me. <laughs> um, number four is to meet your protein needs. No matter, as I mentioned before, if you're trying to lose weight, gain weight, if you don't care about your weight, which you don't have to care about your weight, um, but protein, we still need to meet our protein needs. Um, because protein is going to play a role regardless. So incorporating your protein throughout the day is such a good habit to get into. Uh, it's actually been proven that having protein throughout the day is more effective than having like a bulk, like a giant intake of protein at like one meal. It's better to have it throughout the day. Um, this includes snacks. So if you go to grab a snack and you're going to go grab an apple, can you have some peanut butter with it? Peanut butter has good protein in it. Um, if you're going to go have some popcorn, can you have some string cheese with it? or can you have a turkey roll up with it? Just trying to pair a protein with a carbohydrate. When we pair protein with carbohydrates, not only does that give us more frequent intake of protein, but it also keeps our blood sugar levels a lot more balanced than if we were to just have a carbohydrate snack. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone there. This is just a reminder, there are tons of different sources of protein out there. It's not just meat, it's beans, it's quinoa. If anyone's a vegetarian on the call, quinoa is a great source of a complete protein. Um, eggs, tofu, nuts, and seeds, which once again, yes, they might be a little bit higher in calories, but they're a good source of protein and sprinkling them throughout the day, you'll be totally fine with. So lots of options here. Once again, similar to the fruits and vegetables, trying to get a variety in here is only gonna help you. And the last piece is sleeping for success. Sleep is, people think that sleep and nutrition are two different animals and they're actually, they're, related, <laughs> very re closely related, related siblings. So we want to aim to seven to nine hours of sleep at night, which I'm sure you guys are all laughing or rolling your eyes right now, because in college, like, are you kidding me? Uh, but it is, it is doable. One thing it takes a little bit of planning, a little bit of self-care, a little bit of setting some boundaries. Um, but it's really important that you get proper sleep. If you can't get seven to nine hours of sleep at night, um, utilize naps. A sleep scientist that I have worked with, uh, for insurance purposes. She's awesome. Sleep scientists are really cool. Check them out. Um, but she talks about how napping is actually a really crucial part. If you don't get, uh, seven to nine hour, hours, hours of sleep a night and trying to keep those naps to about 30 minutes or so. The reason that sleep is so important when it comes to nutrition is being in that sleep state is when your body gets to recover and grow and, and maintain its strength. If we don't give it enough time to recover and sleep, we're going to be running on empty really quickly. It'll make you more injury prone. It'll make your nutrition be thrown out of whack. And that's because when we are deprived of sleep, our home, our home, our hormones get thrown out of whack. We decrease our, our growth hormone. We increase our stress hormones and we are, our appetite regulating hormones are all over the place. Our gray lens up, our gray lens down. Like it's, it's all over the place. Um, so this is when we start to see some negative effects on body mass and dietary intake. Once again, think about when you're up late at night, what are you craving? You're craving those nutrient or calorically dense nutrient light snacks, chips, crackers, whatever it may be. So sleep is really important and try, try your best to get quality sleep whenever possible. Okay. We made it to the end. 
let's take any questions. It can be about anything we talked about or it can be anything we didn't talk about, but now is your time um, to ask any questions that you have about nutrition and I will do my best to answer it for you. Um, I had a question. Yeah. Um, I guess it's on the snacking, but maybe eating front overall. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to practice, I guess, intuitive eating yes. or mindful eating. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, like, for example, sometimes I study and I want a snack. And when I think about it, like, it's not really that I'm hungry for a snack, but either I'm like stressed about what I'm studying or bored <laughs> of studying. Totally. Um, so I guess if you have any tips on intuitive eating or like how to address those things, even if we acknowledge that it's not a hunger cue. Yeah. It takes a little bit of practice as you obviously alluded to. So it's not something that comes super easily. So a couple of things that I personally use when when I acknowledge like, okay, I'm not really hungry, but like, I still, like, I just need something to like, to snack on. Like, I still just want something to kind of occupy my time. First is drink some water. Hy hydration is often misconstrued for like hunger or cravings. And so try to have a big glass of water um, when you kind of feel that when you're like, I, I need something, but I don't know what I want. Try to have some water first and see if that doesn't change how you're feeling. The second is, and this is kind of what I alluded to when I talked about balance or like when it's okay, when you should, you know, allow yourself to have a treat or whatever it may be. Maybe it's something where you're like, okay, I'm just gonna, like, allow yourself to have whatever it is that sounds good. Maybe it's a little scoop of ice cream or a brown, whatever, whatever you're craving. Sometimes it's just best just to allow yourself to have a little bit of it because instead of, instead of fighting the craving or instead of fighting with yourself, like I want it, but I shouldn't have it. I know I don't need it. Sometimes it's better just to have a little, have some of it. You'll be amazed that if you just give yourself that grace and that, that okay to have what your body is quote unquote craving, you'll be amazed that you actually end up not wanting as much and you'll, you'll actually end up eating less of it. So sometimes giving yourself that permission to incorporate that will actually allow yourself to not want it as much. Does that kind of make sense? It's kind of a weird, like mental spot to get into, um, but it, it does work. It is effective. So I would say, I would say check your hydration, that's good for everything, but also sometimes just kind of change your mindset and allow yourself to have the snack, allow yourself to be like, okay, I'm gonna go eat a cookie. And then before you know it, you'll have one cookie, you'll be done and there'll be no skin off your back. Does that kind of answer your question? Does that help you at all? Yeah, got it, thank okay. you. Cool, yeah. A lot of practice, I guess. Yeah, it's, it does take practice and it takes some like understanding your real hunger cues. Like it just takes a little bit of figuring it out, but you're on the right track for sure. I did see someone asking about why we're craving certain foods at night. I think, let me make sure I'm reading that. <laughs> Get to the chat. That might've been you actually. Is there a reason that our body craves certain kinds of food after 8 p.m.? So the reason that we have cravings that are typically like sugary nutrient or calorically dense, gosh, I keep saying it, foods is because it's because of what we're, we're not fueling properly better throughout the day. If we can fuel more effectively throughout the day, if we can get some more protein throughout the day, space out our feeling throughout the day, you'll be amazed at how much less you're craving those foods at night. It's all correlated because when it gets to be nighttime and you start, you're having those cravings because your body like didn't get enough during the day. So if we can optimize kind of your majority of the day fueling, you're going to be amazed of what you, of how intense those cravings end up being at night. They're going to be a lot less uh, than they maybe are now. So it's all connected. Good question. What else? What other questions do you have? What other topics that we not talk about that you might have questions about? Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. You're good. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, so I've been like weightlifting for like over a year now. Awesome. And I'm not super interested in like losing weight or gaining weight, but I'm more interested in like losing fat and replacing it with like lean muscle mass. But like, yeah. I don't really know how to do that because it seems like it's either like cut or bulk and I don't want to do either. Yeah. So muscle weighs more than fat. So you are going to like, you are something like your, your body composition is going to change. Right. Um, so a couple things for anyone that wants to, that's a common goal. I see a lot of my athletes having is how do I gain mass or gain lean body mass, but lose fat mass. The first is, is to prioritize protein. Like we talked about. So making sure you're meeting your protein needs, that'll help. That'll help keep your intake really balanced, but also give your body the um, the protein it needs to kind of tone up and, and lean up and keep those muscles really strong. So definitely prioritizing protein. Um, 
And then something huge, especially for anyone in strength, strength training is making sure you're starting your, um, your lifts well-fueled. So that might be like, you have, maybe you have to add a snack. Maybe you have to add a snack in before, before you go lift, before you set your workout, because starting, starting a workout in an anabolic state, meaning in a well-fueled state will allow your body to build, to build more muscle, if that makes sense. So I think, so by starting your, your sessions really well fueled is going to be really key. So I think those are two areas that are right off the top of my head that are relatively simple to integrate, not easy, but simple, I think would be a good starting point. Um, yeah, that's where, I, that's what I would, I would start with. And then we can, there's obviously, there's a lot more we can go from there. Those are two kind of good starting points for you. Good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jenna, did, where'd you go? I think I, I think it was Jenna maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I just had okay. a quick question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about like, at least like if it's even like good to use protein powder and if so, like, cause I feel like I don't get nearly enough protein and I see that as a like way to do it, but I don't even know like where to start. Cause I feel like there's such a big market out there of different types of protein powder. So many, there's so many protein powders out there. So the first thing, and you kind of alluded to it is take a look, like really be, take a second and be critical of yourself in terms of like, are you trying to get protein throughout the day? And it's just really hard for you. Are you like, is there anything you can do to increase your protein intake throughout the day? If there's not, which it's okay if there's not, but if there really is, you're like, I really just can't either. I don't, I don't feel, I don't like to eat meat or I don't like to eat protein a lot. Like whatever the reason is, if you, once you take a second and look at your, your diet and you decide that you need a protein powder, that's the first step when it comes to different, like what to look for in a protein powder. So whey protein is probably going to be your best bet in terms of the source of, um, source of protein. And one of my personal favorite brands is clean K L E A N. Uh, it has that NSF certification. I would say half of my athletes utilize the clean brand. It's just a really good brand. It is a little bit more expensive. So once again, it's not for everybody. Um, but that is a, is a really good brand to look for. Otherwise, even like there's like some good Costco brands out there. So I, it doesn't have to be fancy, but the most important thing is that when you look at the label, the first ingredient should be whey protein, like whey protein. <laughs> if it's not the first ingredient, don't even waste your time with it. But as we talked about, we want to preferably look for a third party tested supplement just to make sure you're getting a really good quality protein powder, because if you're going to spend your money on it, you want it to be effective, right? You want it to do what it's supposed to do. So I would say that step one is to see if you can't add in protein some other way with food. And if you don't think you can, which is okay, then just making sure you're looking for a, one of those NSF certified products, which is a whole list on the NSF certified NSF website. Um, or you can send me an email. I can send you some other options as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. What else do you guys, anything else come uh, to mind? Is there something else Ooh. I can help? Siri's talking to me. Um, what else can I help with? What other questions do you guys have about anything you see on social media or any trends or anything at all before we let you go? Add another one, uh, but I could, could we also email you the questions maybe so that- You're welcome to email me. Yeah, if it's something like more individualized or you don't feel like, yeah, you can, you're welcome to email me, um, but don't be afraid to ask it as well. Um, I guess what I was wondering now was maybe that's more useful for everyone is just uh, if there's a recommended time frame before and after a workout, especially if it's like a weightlifting one, for example, as I yeah. mentioned, for really which question. you eat. Yeah. Really good question. Um, so the closer you get to like the start of a workout, that's, let me start over. So about four hours before a workout is when you can eat a normal meal protein, carb, fat, like a normal, let's say lunch, as you get closer and closer to workout time or exercise time or game time, the need for protein and fat goes down a lot quicker than carbohydrates, carbohydrate does. Um, so it's a lot, that's a fancy way of saying that when you're about an hour before a workout, that's when it's ideal to have like a quick, simple carbohydrate snack, have a banana, have an apple, have a granola bar because that'll give you kind of that last little, it'll top off your energy stores. It'll give you enough time to digest it and to get the benefits of it. And you'll be, you'll feel really energized and be able to work at a really high intensity, regardless of what you're doing, whether it's lifting or running or practicing, whatever it is about one hour before is when it's just carbohydrate. Then depending on what the rest of your day looks like, that's kind of, we kind of go from there. 
post post workout, there's actually been a lot of debate about if it's important to eat like right away or if you have a little bit more time to like relax. Um, I'm in the in the state that if the quicker you can get some food or or fuel in your body, the quicker your body can start to recover, right? Because it it has more more to work off of. Typically after exercise, our appetites are low, right? That's normal. <laughs> um, uh, workout or exercise tends to suppress our appetite. This is when you see, this is where using liquid or or um, smoothies or chocolate milk is is a good option because it tends to to go down easier. Um, but that's I would say within an hour, you want to try to get something in your system. The priority goes to carbohydrates first and then protein. That's why chocolate milk is really popular because it actually has a great ratio of carbs to protein, um, peanut butter toast, um, protein bars. That's where it's okay to have something really small and simple, but getting something in your system within an hour is going to be probably the most, the most beneficial. Once again, good source of carbohydrates, good source of protein. If you want more of like, send me an email with that question as well. I have a great graphic I'm thinking of I can send you that kind of helps explain that maybe a little bit more simply. And we can talk about maybe what you specifically are looking for. So send me an email about that as well. Got it. Thank you so much. This was yeah. super useful. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, you guys. Well, I think I don't see any more questions. So if you do have any more questions, um, feel free to send me send me an email. It's brooke at nutritionwithbrooke.com. Um, Sarah has my info as well. So you're welcome to, she can connect us as well, but, uh, thank you for, for being here. I know it's kind of late, so I appreciate you guys taking the time and hopefully this was helpful and good luck with it all and have a good, have a good rest of your weekend. You guys are free to go. Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Brooke, I'm going to, I have to jump into another meeting, but if yeah, you go for it. This recording, if this one works, just send it to me. I'll send it to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. We'll we'll be in touch soon. Sounds good. Bye. All right. Bye.